This is Coding Math, Episode 50, IFS Fractals. In Episode 47, we discussed weighted random functions. And in Episodes 48 and 49, we talked about 2D matrix transformations. We're going to put all of that into use in today's examples. IFS stands for Iterated Function System. If you break that down, it's a system with a function that is iterated. So that function is called over and over, and it creates something. Of course, because we're talking about fractals, we're into some kind of dynamical system where feedback from earlier iterations affects the current iteration. Now, for most functions, visually graphing the result of this kind of iteration would result in either complete chaos or just a single blob. But we're going to look at a few special systems that do some very amazing things when we iterate them. In truth, most fractal formulas end up being some sort of iterated function system by definition. They're almost always created by running the same function over and over again. But when people say IFS fractals, they very often mean the type of fractal that we're going to look at here today. As a note, if you're into fractals and like what you see on this channel, you might want to check out my self-published book, Playing with Chaos. You can find out more about it on playingwithchaos.net. It's available on the Amazon Kindle store or through Gumroad, where you can get it in several different DRM-free formats. And there's a whole chapter in there on IFS fractals. Okay, enough shameless self-promotion. The first example we'll create is called the Barnsley Fern, named for its creator, Michael Barnsley. If you're into fractals, you may have heard of him, or may even have a copy of one of his books. I do. As for why it's called a fern, well, I don't want to give any spoilers. Anyway, the strategy for this fractal is that we're going to start with a single random point. Then we'll choose one of four options on each iteration. Totally randomly, but a weighted random, as discussed in episode 47. This is perhaps one of the strangest things about this fractal, the fact that it's all based on random choices, and yet, what it outputs is anything but random. Depending on what choice is made, we'll transform that point in some way. And we'll do that with a 2D transformation matrix. Each of the four choices will define six parameters for a particular matrix. We'll apply the transformation dictated by that choice to the original point, and then we'll plot the new point that that transformation makes. Then we'll do it again. Take the new point, the one we just transformed, and make another random choice that will give us another transformation matrix to apply. It might be the same one we just applied, or it might be different. But whatever it is, we apply it to the last point, which gives us a new point, and we plot this. And we continue this over and over, transforming, plotting, randomly choosing, transforming, etc. And we see what kind of pattern this might or might not make. So let's dive right in and start coding. We know that we're going to need an array of choices, so let's call that rules, since it's going to contain the rules for how to transform the point. Each object in that array is going to have seven properties, six for A to F, or A to D and TX and TY. I like TX and TY, as I said before. It's also going to have a seventh property, weight, which is the percent chance that that particular rule will be chosen. And where do these numbers come from? They come from Michael Barnsley. Here they are. You can find them on Wikipedia or Wolfram Mathworld or many other places on the net. And how did Barnsley come up with them? Well, you'll have to ask him. Anyway, this table is pretty straightforward. We can just plug these numbers here into our rules array. I'm just going to paste them in here. They're in a bit different order here than the chart I just showed, but all the numbers are exactly the same. Now, before we go on, let's try to get some idea of what's going on with each of these rules. It's a good exercise to look at the numbers of a matrix and try to visualize what they'll do, at least to some degree. In the first rule, you can guess that we're rotating by some amount and probably scaling too, and shifting a bit on the y-axis. And you can see that this has a weight of 0 0.85, which means it's going to get called the majority of the time. The next two also have some rotation and scaling, and also some change on the y-axis, and weights of 0 0.07, so these will get called roughly equally. The last rule has no rotation or translation. It's also scaling to zero on the x-axis and to some small amount less than one on the y-axis. It's also only called 1% of the time. You might also notice that b and c are different numbers in a couple of the rules. If we were doing a straight rotation, these would be the sine and minus sine of some angle. The fact that they're different indicates that there's a skew going on. We didn't cover skewing in the matrix math episodes, but feel free to look up 2D skew transformation matrix to see how that works. I might get to that transform one of these days. 
Finally, note that all the weights add up to 1. OK, back in the code, I'll create a point with a random x and y. The points we'll be dealing with will generally be normalized, meaning they'll be from minus 1 to plus 1 on the x and y axis. In practice, they'll be a bit larger, but not by much. So we'll have to scale them up when we plot them so we can actually see something. Then we'll call the function iterate. Iterate is first going to get a rule by calling get rule. We'll get to that in a bit. But we'll assume we have a rule now with a transformation matrix in it. We're going to transform this point to a new point by using this matrix. Again, we have a 2 by 3 matrix here in our point here with an extra row containing 1. So when we multiply, we'll get a times x plus b times y plus tx times 1 for the new x and c times x plus d times y plus ty times 1 for the new y. So we can code this fairly easily. I'll make some temporary variables, x1 and y1, so they won't interfere with x and y in the middle of the calculation. x1 will be x times rule a plus y times rule b plus rule tx. And y1 will be x times rule c plus y times rule d plus rule tuy. Then I can assign x1 and y1 back to x and y. Then we'll plot the point with a call to plot x, y. We'll also code that function up in a moment. Finally, at the end of iterate, let's say request animation frame iterate, so this will be iterated. Now we can get to those other functions. First, get rule. We'll generate a random number called rand. Then we'll loop through the rules array, getting a reference to each rule. If rand is less than rule.weight, we return rule. If not, we subtract rule.weight from rand and continue the loop. Because all the weights add up to 1, one of these rules would definitely be returned. If you have any questions on what we're doing here, go back to episode 47, Weighted Random. Finally, plot is really simple. We'll just draw a fill direct at xy, making it 1 pixel square. We should be good, so let's run it. Well, looks like not much is happening. But wait. Up here in the top left corner, there's a little smudge forming. Let's transform the canvas on the x-axis to bring that to the center. But remember, the point coordinates are in a very small range, starting at less than 1 and scaling and translating by very small numbers. We need to scale this whole thing up to see what's going on. Down in plot, rather than plotting x, y, I'll plot x times 50 and y times 50. OK, now something is definitely going on. Now remember, Canvas has its y-axis flipped, so let's deal with that. In the initial transform, I'll translate by height. And then in plot, I'll plot minus y times 50. And now you see why this is called the Barnsley Fern. A couple more tricks. First, to make it speed up, let's put most of this iterate code into a for loop that will draw 100 dots per frame, rather than just one. Ah, much better. Then, rather than drawing a full pixel, let's make it draw a fraction of a pixel. This will take a bit longer to take shape, but it will give the illusion of being at a higher resolution. Another trick we can do is assign a color to each rule. I'll just assign a property named Color and set it to red for the first one, and then green for the second one, blue, and yellow. And now in iterate, we'll call plot x, y, rule.color. And in plot, we'll set the context fill style property to the color that was just passed in. This will let us know what rule is responsible for drawing what part of the fern. And we can see that the yellow rule, the one with all the zeros, creates the stem. The blue and green rules create the bottommost leaves, and red creates the rest. Fascinating that so much order can come out of random choices. Now the Barnsley fern is a fractal shape. Look at any one of the leaves on the fern. It's a copy of the entire shape itself. And look at any one of these sub-leaves on any one of the leaves. It's also a copy. And if you could scale this up with high enough resolution, you'd see this continuing to be self-similar into infinity. So, back to the earlier question. Why those numbers? Well, because those numbers make this fern. I'm sure Barnsley did a lot of experimenting to come up with these particular transforms, but they aren't sacred. 
Let's play around with him. First I'll turn off the color. Then I'm just going to change a single parameter, the D property, for the first choice. I'll make it 0 0.95. And now we have a very spiky fern. I'll put that back and change D in the second choice. Now the right hand leaves are long and narrow. I'll put that back and change the third choice. And now the left hand leaves are skinny. Let's mess with the weights. Remember, we have to keep them adding up to one. I'll take a bit off the first choice and add that same amount back into the last choice. Remember, this choice creates the stem. So now we have the very stemmy fern, more like some kind of tree. I really like this one. So play around with this and see what else you can come up with. Even though it can be hard to grasp exactly what it means when you change a particular number, it's fun seeing the images it can create. There are other rule sets that create other specific images. I'll just comment out the Barnsley one and paste another one in here. It's the exact same format, a list of objects with A through D, TX, TY, and weights that add up to one. Here there are six rules instead of four, but it should work in our existing system just fine. Let's run it and see what it creates. Oh, it's a tiny little fractal tree. I'll change the 50s here to 350 to make it bigger. Neat. Again, notice how each branch of the tree is a copy of the tree as a whole. And each branch of each branch is a copy, and so on. You can go ahead and try and set up colors like we did on the first fern and figure out which rules create which part of the tree. And try messing with some of the 2D transformation parameters to see how that deforms the tree. You might even want to try creating your own IFS fractals from scratch. As a final plug, there are even more examples of IS fractals in my book, Playing with Chaos including one that generates random rule sets. Fun stuff. Check it out.